Welcome to In Studio from Simply Timeless. I'm Jay Daniels. Why do we dream? Is there something to be learned from our dreams? Recently, I had the pleasure of speaking with vocalist and composer Ken Edmondson. This is the first in a series of special Zoom interviews with artists such as Cat. Her latest album, Dreamers Do, features well-known classics, along with some of her own original works. But first, we start at the beginning. Here's Cat Edmondson sharing the story about one of her first musical experiences, starring Gene Kelly and Debbie Reynolds. I have a vivid memory of the first time I heard Singing in the Rain. I was watching the movie. I was sitting in front of the television, and I saw Gene Kelly on the stage, and I was totally captivated. And the sound of his voice and the orchestration and what he was singing about and then how he was dancing throughout the song. Um, all of that was a revelation to me. I actually knew watching it at the age of four that I would, I would be doing the same thing. And it was a, uh, a, a certainty that I had. In fact, I was so certain about it that I also knew that Gene Kelly knew it too. <laughs> did, did you tell him so? <laughs> in my own way, I did. I, I remember going into my bathroom where there was a big mirror and beholding myself in front of the mirror in the way that I saw Gene Kelly on the screen. And, and so there I was on the screen, if you will, and, and I started singing it. I started singing the song and watching all of my movements as I did it. And of course, you know, I was fantastic and I couldn't wait for Jean to see this. So I, I remember running back to the television and then seeing Debbie Reynolds pop out of a cake singing. All I do is dream of you. And these songs very much informed me. They very much informed the direction that I would then, go in subsequently and all I do is dream of you is one of the songs that I've recorded on my new album. What did your mom think about this? I mean, you as a four year old taking to this music so seriously. You know, she wasn't surprised at all, which is a really interesting reaction. I think um, it says a lot about her, but with every turn I've taken and stride that I've made, she's not um, surprised. She just thinks, well, of course, of course, you're, this is great. You're going you're gonna to be great. And uh, that kind of, what is that? It's a confidence that allowed me to not doubt myself, perhaps, and and question all of the necessary things between my dream and doing it. Mm -hmm. um, incidentally, she is a beautiful singer. And though she never pursued it, when she was in her early 20s in college, she would go and sit in with jazz groups at nightclubs and sing the occasional song. And, um, and no one in my family has, has pursued the arts as a profession, but we're all inclined. I mean, when we get together, we sing songs together and mm. we, we feel very comfortable sharing the arts together. Now, did you grow up an only child or was it just you and your mom? It was just me and my mom. Yeah. My parents divorced uh, when I was two and my dad wasn't around and, um, my mom and I were a team. Would you say that this music, even though you were so young, watching Singing in the Rain with Gene Kelly or watching some of these Disney classics, would you say that somehow these songs were able to connect with you on a, a deeper level than just, you know, being a passive listener on the surface? Absolutely. I felt in watching them that the music was as readily mine as it as it was Gene Kelly's or the Disney 
characters that I was watching, you know, I, I, I was able to adopt the music as my own and I felt no separation with it. Um, and flash forward to my adult life and singing the great American songbook. And I find that a lot of people are intimidated to interpret the great American songbook. People take it very seriously, which, you know, I, that's fine. There's an awe and a reverence for this music, which I love. But I've never been frightened of this music, or maybe a better word, intimidated, because at such an early age, um, this music was my friend. <laughs> and, and therefore, um, I'm not intimidated by my friend. You know, I, there's a lot to be said for er an early exposure to something Children soak things up without a lot of conditioning, a lot of conceptual ideas or doubts, if you will. And, and it was just this very fortunate period in which I infused all of my confidence and belief into this music. Were there opportunities throughout school that allowed you to uh, build up some of your Musical talents? There was a, a fundraiser that our elementary school was always participating in on an annual basis called United Kids Way. And um, we would raise money for other less fortunate children. And I remember writing, taking the initiative and writing a song for the fundraiser and sharing it with my teacher and she shared it with the principal and I got to sing it um, on the PA system throughout the school. And I discovered quite early, that was I was in fifth grade, I was 10 years old, I discovered that I could be writing these songs and impacting people. I also performed in, in school plays and whatnot, but it's funny. I, I was never, um, I wasn't chosen a lot um, in choir or, yeah, j pretty much in any choir that I was in, I was quite overlooked. Um, but I, I auditioned for our high school musical when I was 16, and I got the part of Sandy in Greece. So I, I got my moment in the spotlight. Mm. And my mom still talks about it to this day. In fact, she, we were discussing, you know, songs that I could live stream. And she suggested that I sing songs from Greece <laughs> and tell the story about my high school musical. So she's very proud still. Now I have the song, You're the One That I Want, stuck in my head. Thanks for that, Kat. <laughs> um, you, you talked about, even in, uh, even in middle school, when you were 10, when you were writing your songs, thinking about the impact that they would have upon other people, do you think of yourself as, a, as an empathetic sort of person? Yes, I do. Um, I'm also an actress, uh, which I think you'd have to be one in order to um, act well. But I think the empathy comes first, uh, the inclination to think in that way, why someone would be behaving in the way that they're behaving. Um, it has always been a fascinating subject to me, mm. where that comes from. I don't tend to look at people in a black and white scenario. Um, I, I, I think that people are all, always fundamentally good and led astray through different conditioning and experiences in one's life. When you are interacting with your audience, when you are working with your ensemble, and frankly, when you are seeking that inspiration to write, how do you listen for the things that go into your work? When I'm writing music, I get very quiet and I pay attention to um, my emotional state, um, 
usually when I write, uh, and I write in my head, I hear uh, often a chorus and arrangements. Um, I hear like instrumentation and production um, immediately. Um, but I, I start to investigate um, the state that I'm in uh, so as to know what it is that I'm writing about. I always end up learning quite a lot about myself through that process. When I'm on stage, I sing, I call my music vintage pop because I think it, it sounds like popular music of bygone eras um, from the 1930s through, I don't know, the 70s even. Um, but I have a, a background in jazz and there's a fair amount of jazz in my music. And part of the reason why I love jazz so much is it requires absolute presence in order to improvise. And I'm most comfortable in that that place. In fact, I, I start to get uncomfortable if everything is scripted. So when I'm forced to be immediately in the moment, then I know what it is that I'm working with and I know where I'm working from and why. I love I love being present. And I think in order to listen, you have to be on the whole. And, and when I'm making music, it all begins from listening, I'm playing off of one another. I even encourage my musicians playing their instruments to, we have a discussion when we're rehearsing and learning new music about what the song is about and the emotion and the sentiment uh, that are being conveyed to make sure that we're all on the same page about what it is that we're expressing. Um, there's nothing rote happening, you know? You're listening to In Studio from Simply Timeless. Our guest this week is the talented vocalist and composer Kat Edmondson, her latest, the album Dreamers Do. I want to... Uh, highlight that term vintage pop and i i remember uh and please forgive me for this one of the first times i heard you was just a short time ago about three four years ago you did an album or actually you did a recording uh with vince giordano and his nighthawks for the uh soundtrack to cafe society it was a woody allen film and uh i remember i was listening to one of our affiliates magic fm out of perth australia and on comes this recording of Mountain Greenery from Rogers and Hart. And it was, of course, a recording that you did with uh, Vince and the Nighthawks. And yes, it has a very vintage sound, and yet you're not even 40. Do you feel as though sometimes you were, you were born a little bit too late? I used to feel that way. Um, and I don't feel that way any longer because I actually... I feel I have a purpose um, here in this time, um, merely perhaps for the fact that I am here. So that's, it has to be the case, right? I'm supposed to be in this time. Um, but I also feel that um, I can offer, um, I often find that when I sing old music or I write in a style that's familiar to people, but not what they are hearing every day uh, that it takes them to a place of not just nostalgia but of presence like we were talking about it self-reflection and and it puts them in touch with um the things they love and the things they dream about and and i feel i have a purpose in that uh, I, I i feel useful if i can bring those things to someone's attention and and possibly um, help them get closer to what it is that they love, what they are looking for. Let's think about these songs for a moment. Uh, a number are your own compositions. Your last album, Old Fashioned Gal, was filled with uh, original works. But uh, I'm thinking about your album, Dreamers Do, and we've talked about a lot of these songs already. Some were written 80, 90, 100 years ago. And yet, somehow, through your work, through your efforts, you make these songs relevant. 
And I don't think it's a very forced effort, but somehow these songs that, I don't like using the word old, but they are older songs. What do you think it is through your own performances that makes these songs relevant? I think it's the same thing that, that I was alluding to before. Um, I learned this music at such an early age. Um, I understood this music to be my friend, if you will, to make a metaphor. <laughs> and so I don't, I don't feel separate from it. And I, and I am from this time. I exist in this time. I'm, I'm always taking in contemporary sounds and new things and because I live here every day, like everyone else. And, but I'm greatly informed by this, this old music. And so I, it's, it's actually quite simple for me uh, to interpret. And also my intention is um, not to, when I, when I sing this music, a lot of people sing these songs and they, it's fun for them. It's like putting on a costume or going to a costume party, you know, and um, it's novel, but it's not novel for me because it's the first music that I learned. And so um, I, it's, it's very much inherent in me. I'm just sharing what it is that I know very well. I know there are literally thousands of songs that both of us know from the songbook, but you often hear that these songs provide a soundtrack for life, the good, the bad, and everything in between. And I know that you have had your ups and downs too. Let me, let me dig at this if I can. Um, say that you're going through a struggle in life, and it seems that everything that could go wrong has gone wrong, and maybe that is maybe that has happened for you. I don't know, but out of the many songs that you know, what is one that I don't know seems to strike at the depth, at the core of who you are, even during the worst times of life? Somewhere over the rainbow. It's about believing beyond all immediate evidence that there's something great to tap into. I do believe that. Hmm. There's a vulnerability about that song to, to state such a belief and to sing it sincerely that um, I love. And um, I, I feel that this, our greatest strength is in our vulnerability. And so that song comes to mind. Which of your own compositions would you say have made you feel most vulnerable? I have a song called Nobody Knows That from... Uh, from my second album, Way Down Low. It's it, It's about unrequited love. Nobody knows that but me, um, is the sentiment. And it's, all, it's, it's exposing oneself to their love and saying, you never knew this, but I, I love you. And, um, and it's, it's very vulnerable. And I, I love that song. It's one of my favorite songs that I've written. I, I wrote a song called A Voice um, in my, on my last record, Old Fashioned Gal, uh, that wasn't uh, an imagined scenario. I was writing it out of, in a particular time when I was in a lot of pain, and I did not want to write that song. I didn't even like the song, hmm. but I felt that I I'd had no choice but to write it. It was just weighing on me so heavily that I just thought I just need to write it and be done with it. Um, and upon doing so, I had this sense that it, there was an importance about it, that maybe I should share it. And then once I shared it, I learned more about the song and myself and other people. And, um, and I feel vulnerable every time I sing it. I've had instances in concerts where I started crying while I was singing it. Um, so it, if that's any indication that it's, it's hard to sing and share. Um, the, the lyrics are, if I had a voice, I would sing and I would be satisfied because I felt at that point in my life that I didn't have a voice. Um, and I was actually having trouble. I was so um, uh, 
low at that point that it was hard for me to physically sing. Uh, it, 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 this feeling of insecurity and a, a lack of my own voice manifested in literally ha being having a hard time singing. And, um, and, and I'm so grateful for that song. And there's, it's, it's not been easy at all to write that song and come by that song and perform it. But lately, just, you know, I don't know, when did I write it? In 2015? So it's five years later, and I'm, I'm starting to enjoy singing it in my concerts. And it's one of my most requested songs. Mm. And I learned that even though I felt insecure and like I didn't have a voice worth sharing, uh, that we all, not only do we all have a voice worth sharing, but that we all suffer. I had, I was ashamed of my suffering and my insecurity, and I didn't want to share that hmm. because I'm normally a very positive, buoyant person. Um, but what I learned from sharing is, I oh, I remember now, everyone suffers. I had lost sight of that. We all have our individual pain, but we all understand what it is to suffer. And that's empowering. Would you say that the aspirations and the dreams of tomorrow was one thing that helped you through that season? Not, not at the onset of writing it. I, I was feeling quite cynical and I was, um, I was watching at the time I was watching a lot of old movies like 1930s films and and I realized I was just doing things to comfort myself um, because I, I didn't feel hope. Um, it was in the making of Dreamers Do, my new album, that I was feeling hopeful again and that it became easy to sing that song all of a sudden. Mm. Um, in fact, I see this new record as very much a companion piece to my previous record, Old Fashioned Gal, uh, an answer to a question that I asked uh, that's the central song on my new album, Dreamers Do, which is Too Late to Dream. Is it too late to dream? Is there a point in our lives when dreaming is um, either... Uh, impractical or irrelevant based on our circumstances. Um, I actually wrote this song when I was writing my previous album and I recorded it for my previous album only to find that it, it didn't really feel like it fit on the record. It felt very heavy and to put it quite frankly, it felt like a drag on the album. There was a, a nice energetic quality to that album and it just felt like it didn't have a place. So I held the song back. And then I was still personally trying to answer this question. And that's why I started listening to all of this old Disney music. <laughs> because these were some of the first things that I listened to and saw that empowered me with these very instructional messages of when you wish upon a star, your dreams come true. Have faith in your dreams, and someday your rainbow will come smiling through. And I believe these messages with all of my heart. So there was an evolution. Why do you think it's good that people keep dreaming? It's something that we do when we're uninhibited. We do it naturally. The times when we don't do it are when we've and told that we can't, or when there are limitations, when there's been some kind of conditioning about not being able to do it. So if it's so natural to us, I think it's a good thing. I think it, it's, it's what we must do. But I think in our dreams, though, in some ways, we do get a, a bit of comfort and peace. What, what do you think? I get great peace from a place of dreaming, both in envisioning something for my future and dreams that I have. Of course, I also, you know, have nightmares. Yeah. We all do. 
I learned in the making of this record that um, the point at which I began to suffer was when I had expectations about my dream. When my, my dream was supposed to be means for something else. Hmm. Uh, be it um, it was supposed to look like something in particular or there was supposed to be uh, some monetary amount attached to it or um, if it was supposed to be a means for promotion of myself and my career, whatever it was, it was supposed to be in service to something else. I think that's overlooking the very powerful existence of the dream itself. I don't, I don't think that our plans, our societal plans of you will first, you know, have this job and then graduate to this and then get married and what, like the, the you know, basic life plans that are, are set out for people. I think they're minuscule in comparison to what a dream is and where it comes from. I mean, we're really talking about the natural world when we talk about dreams. They're just as magnificent as a mountain. Why does that exist? And the oceans. We don't know where our dreams come from. Looking introspectively, were there any dreams that you had that you wanted to come true but didn't? No, not not so far. Um, it's more that my dreams have taken different forms than I expected. I've had, um, I used to be on a major label. I have my own independent label now. That was a surprise to me in my career. I've had tremendous things happen. I've been on national television shows and... Um, on all different stations and I've, I've played at Carnegie Hall and I've done really wonderful things. And I've also anticipated doing other things at this point in my life that I have yet to do. And, and that for me was uh, a, a disappointment because I'm, I have great expectations. But I want to emphasize again that that word expectations we burden our, our dreams with our expectations. When we were children and we would lie down in the grass and look up at the sky and just dream without any inhibition, there was no suffering about that exercise. It's a place of great peace and joy. And I think what people don't realize is productivity. There's so much momentum that can't, can come from merely having a dream. And we often think that we have to put the cart ahead of the horse and make X, Y, and Z happen before the dream can be realized. And then we lose sight of what it is to just dream and allow and see what happens, see what the purpose is, see what our purpose is. You have talked about making this classic music relevant. You've talked about being able to provide people some sort of hope through your music. On this idea of purpose, and this doesn't have to be professionally, this can be personally, whatever. At this stage in your life, what do you believe your purpose in life is? To remind people of, of themselves, of the things that they inherently know of their own wisdom, which I think is close to dreaming. I think <laughs> it, it can be often interchangeable. Mm -hmm. Why music? It shows me. I can sing with ease, and I hear it readily. It just comes to me, and I feel like a vessel for it. Kat Edmondson, our guest this week during In Studio from Simply Timeless. Take a moment and visit her website, catedmondson.com. The name of her album is Dreamers Do, and I highly recommend you purchase a copy for yourself. Cat, thank you for taking the time to speak with me. A special word of thanks to Mark and Josh at Groove Marketing for their support. Until we meet again, I'm Jade Daniels, thanking you for joining us in studio. Sweet dreams.